We're now moving on, and I don't know if you're all aware of it, um, but we have sitting with us one of the, I think, yeah, definitely most important experts for digital labor because um, you organized a conference last year um, that was, and I think nearly everybody was there talking, and I hope you brought some of the knowledge with you and will share it with us. Um, Trevor Schultz is an author and activist. He is an associate professor for culture and media at the New School New York. Uh, funnily, those two never met before here. <laughs> it's also one effect of the global culture we live in. Um, among other books, he has edited Digital Labor, The Internet and Playground as Factory, and his book, 21st Century Work, is forthcoming 2015 with Polity Press. So I should. First of all, like I'm really happy to be here. It's, a, it's such a lovely event, and it feels like Christmas. Like all the friends are here, and just really excited. Um, so there were actually two conferences. So in 2009, uh, I started with uh, this uh, Internet as Playground and Factory, and some of the people in the room here were actually there. Um, and uh, then the conferences just happened last November, dealt uh, with digital labor again, uh, this time focused more on uh, paid uh, digital labor. So it's in that context um, that I'm sort of reporting, I guess, from this last event. Do you want to pull up the um, website? That would be awesome. The website, I see you have it there from the conference. Um, I'm not connected, oh, but maybe okay. you can do it. OK. Could, we, could the techniques switch back to his computer? Let's computer. <laughs> oh, we just. So the backlash against the unethical labor practices in the collaborative sharing economy have been uh, overplayed. So recently you had reports in the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, and uh, other uh, media uh, basically railing against uh, online labor brokerages like TaskRabbit, Handy, and Uber because of an utter lack of concern for their workers. At the recent uh, Digital Labor Conference, my colleague uh, Mackenzie Walk, who will speak, uh, I think, right after this, uh, said that we are not what we are entering is not quite capitalism as classically described, but this is something worse. But just for one moment, imagine that the algorithmic heart of any of the citadels of anti-unionism could be cloned and uh, be brought back to life under a different ownership model with fair uh, working conditions and... <coughs> Sorry, I got lost my track here a little bit. With fair working conditions as a humane alternative to the free market model. Take, for example, Uber's app uh, with all its geolocation and uh, ride ordering capabilities. Why do its owners and investors have to be the main benefactors of such platform-based labor brokerages? Developers, in collaboration with local worker-owned cooperatives, could design such a self-contained program for mobile phones. Despite this meteoric rise, uh, we see and we see backing of some you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and an estimated uh, value of billions of dollars, uh, as well as massive international reach, there is nothing inevitable to Uber's long-term success long-term success. There is no magic when it comes to developing such piece of software. It's not rocket science. Of course, technology is only one part of the equation, and instead of letting techno-determinism run its course, uh, I would rather point to the long history of worker-owned cooperatives with E.P. Thompson and uh, Robert Owen. Just forget about all the trending lifestyles. The giant automaton could get a new set of operators soon. There isn't just one inevitable future of work. Let us apply the power of our technological imagination to uh, practice forms of cooperation and collaboration. And worker-owned cooperatives could design their apps-based platforms, fostering truly peer-to-peer -peer ways of providing services and things and speak truth to the new platform capitalists. I've been part of cooperatives all my life. I, live in, I lived in communes. I experienced firsthand how they can put people at the center of the equation. 
but uh, at the same time, you would be uh, mistaken if you think that I have a somewhat idealist, idealized view of everything cooperative. To start with, myennials might stress their individual careers over an allegiance to any cooperative. And then the problem of competition with global corporations that are uh, rolling in money is also a key challenge. And while Silicon Valley's turbo capitalists are zipping ahead, social movements as well as regulators can be slow. For hackers and long-tail workers and labor activists, now is the time to step up their efforts before the network effect chisels brands like Uber into stone. So I will start with a few comments about work and the sharing economy and then advance an intensely practical argument about what I call platform cooperativism. So business gurus suggest that there is a logical step from the sharing of content through social media to the rental of goods, space, and the provision of transport through de facto labor companies like Feastly, Carpooling, Handy, Cozaza, Eatwith, kitchen, surf kitchen Surfing, TaskRabbit, and Uber. Consumers uh, raised with an appreciation of low prices above all else welcome many of these market incumbents. And of course, all of these developments play out against the background of deliberate shockwaves of austerity that followed the 2008 financial crash. The sharing economy is uh, portrayed as a harbinger of the post-work society and path to ecologically sustainable capitalism. Google will conquer death itself, and this new disruptive economy will rid us of Jurassic forms of labor, which might well include what David Graeber refers to as bullshit jobs. Uh, but by now, only few people still fall for the solidarity theater of the disruptive uh, sharing economy. It's deceptive peer rhetoric when referring to individual workers and consumers, as well as its constant talk of changing the world. You just need to think of uh, HBO's uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, they figured it out by now, right? People understand that it's the modus operandi of the community managers of the sharing economy to conflate multi, multi million dollar commercial entities like Uber with non-market peer-to-peer projects like Folded or Wikipedia. Also, the mystifying association of the sharing economy with Occupy or the Arab Spring lost its pull for anybody who has been paying attention. Just like in the pharmaceutical industries, these community managers of key companies in the sharing economy are frequently young, likable women. Let's say you come across uh, the fact that TaskRabbit and TopCoder explicitly bar their workers from contract contacting each other. Then you might strongly feel that that is completely unacceptable, but while such practice may seem disagreeable, critics often hesitate to confront the before-mentioned raps of such abuses, about such abuses. If you are taking a closer look at the templates of 21st century work they are currently, that are currently put in place, you will notice uh, a trajectory of workers taking on gigs, many gigs at once. So Sasha Lobo and uh, Martin Kenny recently introduced the term platform capitalism, which I would define in reference to subcontracting and rental economies with big payouts going to a small group of people. Occupations that can't be offshored, like pet walkers or home cleaners, are now subsumed under platform capitalism. And even if you hesitate to categorize emerging unregulated platforms like Handy as uh, innovative, it's hard to deny that baby boomers are losing uh, sectors of the economy like transportation, food, and various other services to millennials who fiercely rush to, demand, to control demand, supply, and profit by adding a thick uh, icing of business onto apps based in user interaction. Companies like Uber and Airbnb are enjoying their Andy Warhol moment, their $15 billion of fame, uh, in the absence of any physical infrastructure of their own. So they didn't build that. Right? They are running on your car, your apartment, your labor, and importantly, your time. They are logistics companies where all participants pay up the middleman. It's the financialization of the everyday 3.0. According to NYU business professor Arun Sundrarajan, personal and professional services are now blended, created, creating a continuum of commercial activity while at the same time raising serious issues about labor protections against uh, discrimination, for example. Nothing remains outside of labor today. The narrative of the sharing economy is just so huggable. 
right? Neighbors can sell the fruit from the trees in their gardens. You can rent an apartment in Rome or a tree house or yurt in a redwood forest. In Berkeley, you can pay your neighbor to cook up a wholesome meal. And uh, now you can even listen to your own Spotify account in an Uber taxi. It's just all so convenient. The sharing economy is presented as the ultimate anti-Turkle, right? Sherry Turkle, author of Alone Together, claims that technology leads to social de-skilling, but here comes the sharing economy positioning itself with the claim that it leads people out of social isolation. Just think of the old lady renting out her room on Airbnb, right? So people come for the consumption and stay for the solidarity. Stay for the, so yeah, right, stay for the sociality. If you agree to drive your car for Uber, much of the time, the company will co-finance the purchase of a new car so that you can afford that Lexus after all. Uh, but much in contrast to that, one of the slogans of the sharing economy is access, not possession. Uh, allegedly, millennials don't have an interest in worldly possessions, they just want access to stuff when they need it. So Zipcar plays into that model of thinking. It's all about the just-in-time delivery of things. You could think of it as a streaming service, right? You don't own the file, you merely stream it. You are paying for what you are using now, and the next time you want it, you are paying for it again. We are streaming our own lives. Uh, the sharing economy is said to bring an end to markets for lemons. No longer will we have to buy used cars that later turn out to be poorly serviced. This is the end of the road for the shady car salesman, the incompetent plumber or wanting electrician. Now, real life profiles on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook connected to these emerging platforms introduce novel checks and balances. And that is at least how the argumentation in favor of these reputation systems uh, and against governmental regulation runs its course. So Ramajan is suggesting that these reputation systems are largely capable of self-regulating this market, much in contradiction to arguments by Canadian technologist and blogger Tom Slee, who argues that these systems don't deliver an adequate measurement for reputation. Who, after all, needs the government if reputation systems can isolate the bad Airbnb host or abusive Uber driver? On the other hand, however, it's important to remind ourselves that governmental regulation still matters when it comes to securing wage floors for workers and preventing monopolies. There's no question about it. Legacy taxi companies have seen better days. Right? Ride ordering apps are making transportation easier and also a bit more accountable as passengers can give dreadful drivers devastating reviews. Uh, some taxi drivers report that they appreciate not having to commit to one company like Uber full time. They enjoy the flexible hours that they can now get with legacy uh, taxi company that they had to, you know, they have flexible hours with Uber. Now they can drive in the morning uh, or afternoon, whereas uh, in the old days with the yellow cab system or with the funk taxi system here, uh, you had to actually commit to uh, shifts or at least with the yellow, taxi, uh, yellow cab system you had to. Uh, they, they enjoy these flexible hours. Ecological concerns about single driver occupancy are also real when thinking about these labor companies. It's a no-brainer. The medallion system could use an update and at far over 800,000 for a single medallion in New York City. The system is completely impenetrable for taxi associations trying to build a small fleet of their own. The medallion cartel prevents such worker-owned organizations from taking hold. With innovative ride rental uh, software, Organizing the taxi business is slightly more conducive for the various types of worker cooperatives. Entities like Uber, Ola, Quick Taxi, uh, Quick Cabs, Taxi for Sure, and Lyft are quite vulnerable because their technologies can be duplicated. But of course, when you see how regulation is steered by costly PR campaigns in big city, when you see how ever increasing brand awareness tilts the network effect in favor of Uber and Airbnb, when you notice the co-financing for new cars offered for Uber drivers, and when you understand that insurance for pa passengers is costing an arm and a leg, then you remind yourself of the old saying, money talks. So think outside the boss. Uh, instead of counting down to next month's apocalypse, uh, let's, let's make the idea of worker-owned cooperatives uh, using right-ordering apps more plausible. 
Cooperatives are facing copious amounts of challenges on the level of competition from dominant uh, players like Uber in terms of public awareness, allocation of work, as well as wage levels. Investors from the financial sectors are looking at Uber with algorithmic calculus, anticipating that the platform has the most users today and will most likely also in the future have the most users. There are, however, many examples that would prove such analysis wrong. If you belong to Generation X, just rattle down the name of social networking services that you used over the years, MySpace, Friendster, and consider how, how many of them lost momentum or even closed shop. Is real social change only thinkable if you have big money on your side? Uh, if we are faithful to that logic, then there would never be a chance for gubernatorial incumbents like New York's uh, Sefa Teachout. Uh, the, the inability to imagine a different life is capital's ultimate triumph. Teach Out recently proposed that one of the pathologies of the current system is that it trains people to be followers. And I might add that it trains people to think of themselves as workers instead of collective owners. An app with the basic functionality of UberX can be duplicated and improved upon by independent developers who are working in tandem with cooperatives. From the very beginning, the development process would have to be steered by workers and developers, but ever more sophisticated crowdfunding schemes using Bitcoin uh, could support such efforts. It is true that the millions of venture capital behind Uber put them into a superior position to strike a regulatory sweet spot between the legislative protections that uh, play out in their favor and the calls for corporate responsibilities that do not. Uber can influence regulation on a city level and might even be able to sway national labor laws. And perhaps, but really perhaps, these templates created at the frontiers of regulation will then be taken on and or over by worker cooperatives who could benefit from established guidelines. An equally likely outcome of these regulatory struggles is that Uber emerges as monopoly, ruling the taxi industry worldwide. Uber would then be the internet explorer of the streets. Uh, the stakes for the drivers are clear. The prerogative of vc back companies is short-term sh shareholder prof profit, but when it comes to offering better working conditions, these startups cannot measure up. The business consortium Pierce aims to position itself not only as labor, as labor brokerage, but also as social safety net for workers in the sharing economy. But given that it mostly represents centralized for-profit upstarts, Pierce is not a genuine alternative to worker-owned cooperatives. Why bother handing over the revenue to Uber, the middleman? Lyft and Uber have serious issues with attrition. The pay rates for drivers can and have been lowered from one moment to the next. Workplace surveillance is constant and drivers can be deactivated or you know, fired as they used to call it at any time for digressions as small as uh, criticizing the Uber mothership on Twitter. Taxi drivers uh, and technologists can coalesce to build an app that equals or outperforms their corporate equivalent. This movement has already started with a driver-owned uh, ride rental service in Israel, in fact, and uh, Fairmondo here in uh, Berlin, uh, which is a co-op-based version of eBay. Worker-owned cooperatives can offer an alternative model of social organization to address financial instability. They will need to be collectively owned, democratically controlled businesses with a mission to anchor jobs, offer health insurance and pension funds, and a degree of dignity. In New York City, you have uh, 24 uh, worker-owned cooperatives, and they are almost exclusively owned by women. And over the past few years, low-wage workers who joined these cooperatives saw their hourly wage increase from 10 to $25 in, 10, in two years. Such models have been uh, propagated for a long time by the likes of Jukai Benkler and Michael Bowens. For Bowens, a peer-to-peer -peer economy um, you know, uh, talks about uh, free participation of equal partners engaged in the production of common resources. So there are examples, uh, in many examples in the UK with some uh, 200,000 people working in 400 worker cooperatives. You might, might have heard about the Basque example of uh, Mondragon, which is a very large uh, worker-owned cooperative. And uh, so apps-based worker-owned labor brokerages that allow workers to exchange their labor without the manipulation of the middlemen are possible, and they are possible for micro-work as well. So Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower would be examples. 
platform cooperativism can serve as a remedy uh, for the corrosive effects of capitalism. It can be a reminder that work can be dignified rather than diminishing uh, for the human experience. Cooperatives are not a panacea for all the wrongs of platform capitalism, but they could help to weave some ethical threads into the fabric of 21st century work. Thank you very much. So th this was my first talk with this was my first talk with reading glasses. So uh, I could actually not see you. I would have. Uh, this is what happens when you you know cross the 40 age limit. So. Thank you, Trevor, for your talk, and thanks for the audience uh, for staying with us in our grim uh, sort of sketch that we gave of the digital labour or the w work we live with today. Um,